general medicine and general surgery so basically these two topics are very uh, uh, for at least for a part of the students it's become a very boring sub subject but i argue that when you are start reading basic subjects very well it is much more easy this general surgery and general medicine it's a combination of all the basic subjects so once you finish the basic subjects then it will be very easy and you should have a uh, special uh, tackle to uh, you should have a, a special strategy to tackle this general medicine and surgery so you should uh, uh, you should know that there will be repeating questions in general surgery and as well as uh, general so uh, medicine but there will be some concepts in each and every chapter there will be some concepts so if you are very much aware about this concept then it will be much more easy to answer the questions from the concept based questions so that is very important so you should be very careful with the uh, and there will be some uh, difficult questions in the uh, in general medicine and general surgery also so some uh, questions which are not at all not, not familiar with the general medicine and general surgery that you can leave but the idea is that you should not leave repeating questions unanswered or wrong and you if you are able to tackle that concept based questions then you are in the game so success doesn't come from what you do occasionally it comes from what you do consistently so that is what i'm uh, telling so if you are trying to read basic subjects and general medicine and general surgery uh, at least if you are able to uh, allocate one hour for this basic subject and general medicine and general surgery then it will be the subject and the it will be much more easier so today's my class i am taking on iv fluids so iv fluids uh, the uh, i will give you uh, a 10 minutes uh, lecture and a 10 minutes question and answer session so it will be total at 20 to 25 minute session so uh, otherwise I, i don't want to uh, give much more vast topics in the uh, first session itself so iv fluids most of the students will be much more familiar with the uh, intravenous fluids and electrolytes so we will start from iv fluids so in fluid and electrolyte balance the body water regulation is the, uh, the it will be controlled by regulation of the volume of liquid ingestion or regulating the urine of uh, uh, volume of urine excreted these are the two methods the uh, body water regulation is happening in the body and you should remember uh, you should you should uh, you should know these basic values like uh, like sodium that is 1 to 3 millimole per kilogram per day and potassium that is 1 millimole per kilogram per day so these are the these are the values that you should remember in and how will you how will you assess this um, uh, mechanism is happening in the body that is by adh mechanism that is adh is a uh, hormone released by pituitary which controls the water uh, water intake from the kidney okay and 
you should know one more thing that is the intracellular fluid compartment will consist of around 65 percentage and the extracellular fluid compartment consists of 35 percentage so a uh, hemostasis between the intracellular and extracellular fluid maintain the fluid integrity in the body and how will you diagnose that if the patient is having dehydration? So the patient may have increased thirst, fatigue will be the, dizziness will be the, headache will be the, or a dark or decreased urine, sticky or dry mouth, loss of skin elasticity and irritability. So these are the symptoms of dehydration. So if you uh, come across a patient with these kind of sim uh, symptoms, you should understand that the patient is suffering from dehydration you have to start the IV fluids as soon as possible. Okay. And how will you replace the fluid lost in the body? So it can be, uh, there are uh, different types of uh, uh, IV fluids. The one is called crystalloids, other one is called colloids, and the other IV fluids which are used for special purposes. Okay, and the examples for crystalloid. What what are the crystalloids that I will come to the come to the uh, come to the directly? And what about crystalloid? These are the five percent dextrose in the water, or five percent dextrose with the 0.9 percent saline, or Ringer's lactate, or 4.3 percent dextrose that is 0.18 saline. So remember, dextrose, Ringer's lactate. Aralate, that these uh, IV fluids belongs to crystalloids. And what about colloids? They are gelatin solution, dextran 40, and heatastran. So this belongs to colloids. And the special purposes that is uh, uh, one is sodium bicarbonate, mannitol, and magnesium sulfate, and calcium chloride. And what, about, what are the functions of sodium bicarbonate? The sodium bicarbonate is used to maintain an acid imbalance in the body. Suppose a patient has had a, uh, acid ingestion, poisoning, then you can give sodium bicarbonate. And what is the use of mannitol? This is a very important question in trauma. The question will come like that. If the patient reported to the casualty with a brain injury, the following medicine should uh, brain injury, the following medi medicine should start immediately. The answer is mannitol. Why? Because this mannitol helps to reduce the brain edema. The mannitol helps to reduce the brain edema, and it and it uh, it prevent the progression of brain injury. So sodium bicarbonate that is for acid imbalance and mannitol is specially used for in brain injury and magnesium sulfate and calcium chloride it is used for specially electrolyte replacement. Then we will come to that what are colloids and what are crystalloids. So a crystalloids means when it dissolves, it forms a true solution. Okay. And it is able to pass through a semi permeable membrane. So, saline, remember, uh, take an example as saline. Saline, when it dissolves, it forms a true solution and it passes through a semi permeable membrane. Got it? So, saline is a crystalloids. And what are the other examples? One is Ringer's lactate and then will Aralite P. So remember these two. One is uh, Salang and Ringer's lactate and dextrose. And what about colloids? Colloids are actually a homogeneous non-crystalline substance consisting of large molecules or ultra microscopic particles of one substance dispersed through a second substance. 
examples gels emulsions salts these are the examples of colloids and what what are the specialty of these colloids one is the particles do not settle okay and and cannot be separated out also by ordinary filtering or centrifuging like those in a suspension so in colloids particles do not settle and they are cannot be separated out by ordinary filtering method and it consists of large molecule or ultra microscopic particles so it cannot be uh, it cannot pass through a semi permeable membrane so these are the difference between one is colloids and the other one is crystalloids and when you come to uh, crystalloids and colloids examples already given uh, crystalloids are isotonic solutions hypertonic solutions and hypertonic solutions like saline and colloids they are known as plas otherwise also known as plasma expanders blood is a colloid and blood products like uh, plasma platelet albumin these will come in the category of colloids and dextrin is otherwise known as plasma expanders okay and what are the advantages and disadvantages of crystalloids and colloids that's the next thing so crystalloids as you all know the uh, when you are taking saline as a classic example again it is cheap it is non allergic no transmission of infection no interference with the coagulation so it can be given to any patient because it is cheap it is non allergic no transmission of infection no interference with the coagulation also and what are the problems with crystalloids because higher volume is required because whenever you are injecting crystalloids it will be easily removed from the compartment okay because it crosses the semi permeable membrane so higher volume is always required so relatively the reason is relatively short amount of time remain intravascularly it easily washed out through kidney okay suppose if a patient is having a, a, a old patient with a cardiac disease or something he a uh, patient is having a uh, uh, now having a fluid loss you need to give crystalloids much more a higher volume this higher volume may damage if the patient is a cardiac patient or if the patient is suffering from kidney this will damage his kidney or heart so in such cases colloids are the uh, iv fluid of choice why because uh, the one advantage is the plasma expansion of a plasma or a, a plasma volume is far superior and it may be a salt sparing okay the expansion capacity of the uh, colloids are much more superior than crystalloids only a very small amount of colloids are required to maintain the fluid loss comparing crystalloids and so colloids are preferred iv fluid of choice in a elderly patient the reason is this elderly patient may have a weak cardiac system or a weak excretory system so the colloids will be preferred in a very elderly patient or if the patient is having a cardiac failure history or the patient is having a uh, 
renal failure history. Then, what are the problems? One is it is very expensive and there will be risk of allergy and there will be coagulopathy and may exacerbate tissue edema because it stays intravascularly for a particularly long time. Is it clear? Okay. And I will discuss uh, each and every uh, IV fluids and their uses. The dextrose is actually supplies calories. So when, whenever we require calories, you should give dextrose. So what are the situations require dextrose? One is an immediate post-operative period because the patient may have a fasting before surgery and after surgery also, after six hours, the patient will be in a fasting. So calories should be given as soon as possible. So you can start the IV fluid with the dextrose. So it is used in cases where blood volume replacement along with some nutrition is required. So whenever the patient requires calorie, you have to give dextrose. Then another one is saline. It contains sodium and potassium in concentration almost similar to plasma. Remember one thing that it should not be given in first 24 hours after operation. This is another important question. That is due to natural sodium conservation. That is due to adrenocortical activity. So in immediate post-operative period, whenever you are giving saline, it should be monitored. Otherwise, don't give. Because immediate post-operatively, the sodium concentration is high in the body. That is due to the adrenocortical activity or sodium conservation. So remember this. And the another one is Ringer lactate solution. So what is the advantage of Ringer's lactate solution? It, it has a, uh, it contains maximum amount of electrolytes. So it is all similar, it contains similar electrolytes concentration as in the plasma. So it is best in the hypovolemic shock. And the uh, slight disadvantage of this uh, Ringer's lactate solution is it is slightly hypoosmolality with respect to sodium. Okay, so dextrose, saline, and Ringer's lactate solution. And you should remember this osmolality. This is asked in. Saline is having osmolality of 308 and Ringer's lactate is having an osmolality around 270 to 280. And these are the two things you should remember. One is saline, it is having an osmolality of 308 and Ringer's lactate is having an osmolality of 275. So, We'll discuss some questions from this part. The fluid usually given in post-operative time. Option A is normal saline. Option B is uh, Ringer's lactate and dextrose and plasma. So what will be the answer? Usually given in post-operative time. Yes. Yes, very good. That is option C, that is dextrose. 
which is not which is contra indicate in uh, uh, postoperative time what will be the answer if the question just turn like the fluid which is contra indicated in postoperative time then the answer will be yes very good nubur jodi rajia shafina very good very good that is normal saline so what is the reason for uh, 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 reason behind that that is due to what conservation that is sodium conservation or adenocortical activity okay very good very good very good sujay singh shafina very good very good and so whenever you give whenever you give uh, lactose you should remember about enhanced lactate production okay in healthy individuals five percentage of infused glucose is directed towards lactate formation okay and in critically ill patient 85 percentage of the glucose is diverted into lactate production okay so even whenever the circulatory flow is compromised infusion of 5 percent extra solution can result in lactic acid production and there will be a chance of increased elevation of serum lactate so remember whenever you give glucose infused glucose or a dextrose there is a, there is always a chance of having lactic acidosis especially in critically ill patient so it is very important point in acid base balance okay then and hyperglycemia again uh, in critically ill patient it causes immune suppression increases risk of infection aggravation of uh, ischemic brain injury all those things you know so remember whenever you give dextrose there is always a chance of having lactate production which causes acid imbalance okay so these are the other uses the plasma and albumin 4.5 and 5 percent is given in burns patient okay normal saline again uh, it is given whenever the fluid is lost that is through either vomiting or diarrhea so in vomiting and diarrhea you should replace the uh, fluid loss with the normal saline and renal lactate is uh, uh, given the drug, uh, drug is the iv fluid of choice in hypovolemic shock because it contains maximum amount of electrolytes okay that hartman solution is what is the answer hartman solution is a that is normal saline b that is renal solution then c is dextrose five percent and d is plasma yes sujay sunny yes that is renal lactate solution osmolality i already discussed it will be come around 270 to 280 then ph will be around 5 to 7 and it contains calcium potassium sodium chloride so this co contribute both cation and anion okay so the answer here is ringers lactate a lactated ringer solution or otherwise hartman solution contains which of the following electrolytes i just explained in the previous yes it contains sodium it contains potassium calcium and magnesium chloride so definitely the answer is all the above it's already discussed then another important one is darrow solution it's given in it contains more potassium it is used for 
hypokalemia so suppose a patient comes with the hypokalemia you can give there a solution so which organ is affected in hypokalemia anybody hypokalemia potassium hypokalemia which organ is affected whenever potassium is sorry sujay whenever potassium is reduced the muscles are affected okay so muscles affected means the organ which is having more uh, more important is heart the cardiovascular system so whenever the patient is having hypokalemia you should give the dare solution and it is much more important than sodium because the cardia it leads to cardia failure if it is left untreated it leads to cardiac failure if the patient is having a hyponatremia or a hypernatremia the patient may have uh, uh, hallucinated condition or in a delirium condition but if the patient is having a hypokalemia it definitely leads to cardia failure so you should correct as soon as possible okay so the answer is all the above right and the fluid to be avoided following trauma or surgery so already you know 5% dextrose isotonic saline renal lactate and blood so what is the answer we have already discussed yes that is due to isotonic saline that the reason is the reason is sodium conservation okay then the colloidal plasma expander used in the treatment of hypovolemic shock hypovolemic shock what is the answer thank you for the response but the answer is wrong why read the questions once again see this mcqs are mcqs are framed in such a way to make you fool the question is what is the question starts with colloidal plasma expander colloidal plasma expander okay so whenever you see a hypovolemic shock don't jump into ringer's lactate okay because the question asked here is colloidal plasma expander why i put this question in this uh, class me is that the questioner who makes the uh, who frame the question some tips like this in the uh, in the framing the question see the question is colloidal plasma expander so the answer is dextran dextran is a plasma expander okay then and the plasma expanders are the agents that they have relatively high molecular weight and boost the plasma volume by increasing the osmotic pressure they are used to treat patient who have suffered hemorrhage or shock but still the uh, first iv fluid of choice is ringer's lactate but in this particular question the question frame is the colloidal plasma expander so the answer is dextran and what do you mean by this dextran they are a water soluble glucose polymer found by bacterial action on sucrose through enzyme sucrose and remember one thing that this uh, fluid expander is due to colloid 
osmotic effect and uh, gravity is slightly greater than blood and broken down enzymatically to dextrinase and excreted in urine that these are the special points that you should remember about dextrans and it contains in multiple preparation dextran 150 dextran 110 dextran 70 dextran 60 and dextran 40 these are the preparations of dextran and the next one a 12 year old patient present with copious diarrhea urine output is low mucous membrane dry skin turgor low what could be the initial management yes copious diarrhea and urine output is low this indicates the patient is going into dehydration and mucous membrane is dry and skin turgor is low so the patient is having dehydration so how will you manage should start managing with the fluid replacement not by antibiotic not by antimotility not by fluid uh, not by reassurance it should start with fluid replacement okay and the material required for applying pressure at iv site alcohol swab betadine swab sterile swab adhesive bandage again that is the sterile swab only a sterile swab is required when you ever you are giving uh, the material required to apply uh, pressure at the iv site okay so then the next one the tonicity of ringer's lactate solution is isotonic normal tonic hypotonic and hypertonic tonicity of ringer solution is always isotonic it contains maximum amount of electrolytes okay so the tonicity of ringer lactate solution is isotonic and the size of iv cannula used for neonates so these are the gauge 28 gauge 24 gauge 22 gauge and 20 gauge so for neonates the iv cannula used for neonates is 24 so this is the same like when you are using for uh, 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 injection right the syringes have different gauges right like that the size of iv cannula used for neonate is remember it is 24 so whenever whenever you see the last three questions okay these questions are framed just to make you uh, if you are not aware about the uh, correct answer it may leads to wrong answer these are all just picking up from a typical question okay so sterile swab then and tonicity of uh, ringer's lactate solution and size of iv cannula these are the three questions which are uh, which are directly taken up from the book and uh, about the la uh, first five questions these are based on a concept based question and they are sometimes repetitive also okay yes sujay we will uh, discuss all these questions in detail in our class so which will be coming soon which will be scheduled uh, to you uh, in coming days okay so iv fluid is a very small topic and if you know this topic very well uh, Uh, in when we are discussing the acid base imbalance in the next uh, next coming classes it will be much more easier
so iv fluids and acid base balance which are uh, which are the common to and infection these are the common topics that can come uh, in uh, general medicine and general surgery okay so anyway we will discuss in detail into the uh, uh, in the class in the coming classes so uh, if you have any queries regarding admission and all you can contact this number or if you have any doubts regarding uh, this particular topic you can contact me also okay so uh, remember one thing uh, i would like to uh, i would like to end the topic with this slide the success doesn't come from what you do occasionally it comes from what you do consistently if you are able to spend 1 to 2 hour 1 to 2 hour for 1 uh, uh, to 2 hour daily then your goal will be achieved so if you start doing from now onwards then you can add half an hour 1 hour 2 hour in coming days so persistency always leads to success so thank you thank you all so uh, in the uh, whatsapp group we will discuss in uh, in class in coming classes we will discuss the details okay so thank you